thank you very much for that brilliant introduction. You almost make me sound good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best. Anyway, so, um, right. If everyone's sitting comfortably. No. <laughs> well, you should be. You've got a glass of wine I've seen already. You? I do. Well, it's Amazing. evening for me, kids, so, yeah. you know. <laughs> It's, more, it's only morning here, so I'm on the vodka. Yeah, so. you bet. <laughs> clear, clear liquids until noon. Clear until noon. It's fine. Right, until the sun's over the yard arm, then we can switch to beer and wine. <laughs> right, okay, so um, share my screen. Let's start with this. Okay, so um, assuming that's working okay. Right, yep. so it's the Over Under Split Shot Masterclass. This is normally a workshop that I teach um over an entire eight to ten hour day with practicals and things but i've tried to condense it down into 20 to 30 minutes so um if there's anything if i breeze through some things a little bit too quick there's going to be q a at the end so if you've got any questions wait till the end and i'll come back and answer them and go over any points if anyone's not understood or, or missed um what i've been talking about so let's get right into it okay um workshop topics so i'm going to be covering um, equipment, so that's lens port, lenses and ports to use, which are basically the two most essential pieces of equipment you've got to select for this kind of photograph. Um, I'm going to go through some techniques such as um, focusing. And then I'm just going to talk about how to focus. I'm going to talk about why we do what we do with the focusing techniques, because it's although it's good to learn this stuff power of fashion, I think it's good to understand the reason behind we doing it, why we're doing what we're doing, because then you can exploit um, the characteristics of your equipment if you fully understand what's going on and use that to your advantage in certain situations so for there there's going to be like an easy a bit of easy stuff for the people new to this type of photography and there'll also be a little bit of technical stuff there for people who are a bit more advanced and um, to take it to the next level so if things are going a little bit above your head please stick with me um, and we'll move through and i'm just basically trying to put a little bit in for everybody basically from a, from beginner right through to advanced and like I said, there'll be questions at the end. Um, some optimised settings, so things like f-stops and shutter speeds and for different situations. Um, exposure, I want to do talk about exposures both using strobe and natural light. Um, the old good old question I get answered all the time is how to prevent water droplets. So there's two methods um, you can use to, to do that, which are both quite effective. And then what I do at the very end, I'll just recap everything we've just talked about in one example image. I'll show you a picture and I'll just go through my thought process um, in creating that picture um, to hopefully clear any, any questions <clears throat> um, before they arise. But like I say, um, if you need anything to ask, well, we can sort that out at the end. Okay, so lenses. Basically, um, when we're shooting it over under photograph, we are stealing techniques from landscape photographers, basically. So you need to, to view this kind of picture as a landscape photograph. So we're gonna use focusing techniques that a landscape photographer would use, and we're gonna use similar lenses to what a landscape photographer would use. So most of they are gonna be ultra wide angles or fish eyes. There is a macro lens on that um, slide there. I'm not gonna go into that today because it's just too technical and it's, it does create a different effect and it's quite novel, but um, I think that would just be too much for this session. So um, some of the lenses I like to use, I've got three lenses that I use now all the time for my over-unders, depending on what I'm shooting. Um, I shoot the, the Nikkor um, 8-15, to 15, which is a really good wide angle lens. I'll use that mostly for reef and um, subjects that aren't uh, animals or humans. I prefer to use a, uh, a rectilinear lens for animals and humans, so I don't distort the shape and they look natural. But for, for reef, coral reefs, things like that, where it's not really going to be as important to keep that the perspective perfect, uh, wide angle is a really, really good lens. Uh, sorry, uh, the fisheye is a really good lens for that. Um, I also use the, uh, the new Z series lens, the S series lens for the Z Nikon Z cameras. This is the 14 to 30. I use this one quite a lot um, for uh, large animals and people. Um, the reason I like this lens quite a lot as well is it also has an 82 mil thread filter on the front, um, which a lot of ultra wide angles of fish eyes don't have. So that allows me to use some filtration, which I'm going to talk about a little later, um, which is very, very useful. And I also like to use on um, DSLR cameras, I like to use the Nikkor 14 to 24 f2.8, which is another ultra wide rectilinear 
lens. Now, a question I do get asked a lot when I get to this point in the workshop is, um, you know, I've got a 15 mil fisheye, do I need a 15 mil rectilinear? What's the difference? So this next slide is kind of just um, showing us what the difference between the two lenses are. Both of these were shot on, uh, the right hand side was shot on the 1424 at 15 mil, the left hand side was shot on the 8 to 15 at 15 mil, so both the focal lengths are identical. And what you can see is in the centre of that frame, the, the bushes just below the sea line there are the same magnification, which is what you'd expect because um, they're both 15 mil essentially lenses. But what the fisheye does is it has a 180 degree field of view from diagonally corner to corner. So what that does is it actually wraps in the corners um, of the frame and, and just brings a little bit more information into there um, with that wider field of view. But obviously there's no such thing as a straight line in a fisheye lens. So everything becomes bent and distorted, which is why I prefer to use a rectilinear for large animals, because as you can see the image on the right, the rectilinear, Magnification is the same, but there's very little distortion. Um, so that's the basic difference between those two lenses. So both are very good lenses to have in your arsenal um, for very different reasons. Um, so dome ports, when it comes to dome ports, um, dome port size is, is quite uh, significant with shooting these lenses. Um, bigger dome ports are better for creating more depth of field and easier focusing, but there are also uses for very small um, dome ports. So I use everything from a four inch all the way up to a giant 17 inch dome port. Um, a good starting point, a good, a good all rounder is a dome port like this one. This is a, just a, a, an Aquatica digital 9.25 inch glass. Um, I use that quite a lot for over-unders as well. That's, that's a really good mid-range. If you're not really sure what to take, what you're going to be shooting, that's a really, really good starting point. A lot of people have 8-inch acrylic, same sort of thing. Um, the 9 the nine to 10-inch ports are probably a little have the edge over the 8-inch. But, um, but a dome port that you might use for underwater photography, um, normal underwater wide-angle photography, is going to be quite sufficient for this job. Um, sometimes, like I say, I use a four inch port. I might use a four inch port if I'm going to shoot like a close focus wide angle over under of something small, like maybe a baby sea turtle or a, uh, or <laughs> a blue bottle, if I'm shooting those sort of things. Um, so, so the small, small inch ports do have the place, but they are quite, you need very, very flat water for, the, for a small four inch. Um, because it gets easily engulfed with moving water. So you need very, very calm conditions, very small subject, very, very close to that fisheye lens that you'll be using behind the four inch port. Um, and that's the only reason I use the small one is because you can physically get a small subject very, very close to the fisheye to create a frame coming shot. If I'm not doing that, I'll be using the biggest port as possible I've got. Um, most commercially available 9.25, like the Aquatica I use or whichever brand of camera uh, water housing you use will suffice. If you do something, want something a little bigger than that to make um, over-unders a bit easier still, um, see me after school. Right. Um, uh, next frame. Okay, so focusing. So here's a demonstration slide, um, a mock-up of, of how we're going to focus on um, on the subject. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to focus underwater. We're always going to focus on the on the underside of the subject and that will become more apparent in the next few slides. I'm going to explain the reason why we'll do that but that's the general rule of thumb is to focus uh, underneath the surface. Um, so what I tend to do is to make sure that happens is I'll move my focus point right down low into the frame. So when I'm framing up a nice 50-50 split, I know the camera's concentrating on the, the bottom half of the frame and focusing on my underwater um, subject. Um, sometimes if you shoot into the sun uh, with low light, um, because the camera's trying to focus underwater, it might the focus might hunt around a bit um, and you don't really want that to happen. So sometimes what I might do is I might set my camera up for back button focus. So I disable the auto focus on the actual shutter. And um, so on a pressure shutter, the, the camera is not going to try and focus, but I'll use the back button to maybe pre-focus on my hand or the subject that I can, and then let go of that um, pre-focus back button and then, and then fire away. And I know the camera's not going to be hunting around. So in low light situation, shooting to the sun, that's quite a good technique. Um, the advantage actually with Aquatica housings and a few of the other underwater housings is you can actually switch between autofocus and manual focus while the camera's in the housing with the DSLR. So that's another way you can autofocus and then flip to manual and, and, then, and then carry on shooting. So I'm going to talk about a couple of 
tech, this is where it's going to get a little bit technical for, for the more advanced photographers, but only for a couple of minutes. So please bear with me. And I'm going to talk about now why we actually focus on the underwater part. Now, if you're new to this, just remember focus on the underwater and you'll be fine. If you want to learn the reason why and understand, so you can use that um, later down to your down the line to your advantage, then this is the reason why we focus underwater. And it's, and it's a two part um, reason really. The first one is to do with um, depth of field, which is um, the amount of sharpness into the photograph. So I focus on a point here, and depth of field is, is the point of acceptable sharpness between me and this point and then that point and beyond. So the, the depth of, of, of field, or the depth of sharpness. Um, and depth of field as a general rule of thumb normally extends about two thirds the distance behind the subject than it does in front of the subject. So when I fire focus on my finger here, say my depth of field is this much in front, it's gonna be double that behind. So that's a good point to remember. Um, and depth of field increases exponentially the further away the subject is. So if I'm focusing on something quite close, like my finger here, my depth of field is going to be very, very limited. If I focus on something in the side of the room, my depth of field is going to be quite huge. Um, and wide angle lenses have greater depth of field than macro and telephoto lenses. A wide angle lens, well, you know, is 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 huge. Whereas uh, if I'm shooting a macro subject, the depth of field is very very limited. But we don't really have to worry about that in this situation. Wide angle lenses have good depth of field, and for over unders, we're using wide angle lenses. So that's all okay. And obviously, the more you stop down, so by stopping down, I mean increasing the f-stop number. And the higher the number is, the more depth of field you're going to achieve. So at f4, you're going to have very little depth of field. At f22, you're going to have a huge amount of depth of field, and particularly with a wide angle lens. And there's just a little graphic explaining that. So let's pretend there's a photographer um, with his camera on the left hand side, he's focusing on the third tree in. Um, his depth of field is going to extend two trees further away from him and one tree closer to him um, or her. Um, and uh, the more that, that f-stop increases in size, the more trees is the, the photographer is going to get um, in focus. And the, if, you, if you really want to get into that kind of thing, there's a great website called Depth of Field Master, DOFmaster.com, and that explains all that in a much greater detail, which you can take your time to absorb. And there's also a little calculator that you can put in what lens you're using and what f-stop you're firing at and all the information, and it'll you know, actually give you depth of field calculation. So the second part to why we focus on underwater is understanding what happens when we shoot underwater through a dome port. So a lot of uh, experienced photographers will know all about this already, um, but if you're new to this then I'll just quickly run through this. So when we shoot through a, a curved port that's touching water underwater, this only applies underwater, um, what actually happens is we create a virtual image. Because of the way the water is refracting in a circle coming through the dome port, what it does is it creates a virtual image which is a lot smaller and closer to the camera. And that's what the camera sees is this, this virtual image. Imagine taking like um, a spoon out of your kitchen drawer and looking in the kitchen spoon and you see a miniature reflection of yourself in that kitchen spoon. Well, that's kind of basically what's happening in a roundabout sort of way when, you, when the camera's looking through this dome port underwater. So imagine that's the picture you're trying to take, this small virtual, virtual image close to the camera. It actually doesn't look like a virtual image when you look through the camera underwater because it's proportionally smaller as it is closer. So a big object over here gets proportionally smaller and closer to a tiny little object here, but it still looks the same because of the way it's got proportionally closer and smaller. You can actually test it um, if you, oh no, actually I won't go into that, that's <laughs> too much. Okay, so we're looking through the dome port um, and you can see ang the, anglers, angus, the anglerfish there on the far right, that's the real anglerfish we're taking a photograph of. What the camera is seeing through the dome port is the virtual image, smaller and closer, so that's what the camera is going to be focusing on. Now if you imagine taking a dome port, bearing that in, sorry, taking a photograph through a dome port over under, um, this is basically, if we could see the virtual image sideways on, this is what we'll be seeing. So we've got the camera there with the dome port. Um, in this case, this slide is representing a nine, point, a nine inch dome port. We've got the real shark that's breaking the surface above the water. That's what the camera is seeing above the water. And then underwater, we have the virtual image. So this is what the camera is seeing underwater. So now it's becoming apparent why we would be focusing on the underwater part of the image. 
because if you remember, as I said before, depth of field extends much further behind the focus point than it does in front. So in order to maximize our depth of field with an over under photograph, focus under the water and let the top side take care of itself. Because if we've got a small enough f-stop, that's going to encapsulate that in sharpness in the depth of field. So here, if I was shooting at f22, focusing on the virtual image underwater that's close to me, the, the f22, the depths, the depth of field would, would make the top side of the image sharp. And I've got a couple um, of examples here. So, um, so that's basically what we've just talked about now, just to, just to show um, the top side sharp, um, focusing on the water. So I think I should have, if I just skip forward there. So here's a couple of real life, um, a couple of real life uh, situations. So this is where I got it wrong. Um, so this is a whale I shot in Tonga um, a few months ago. And I was shooting at f9, and as you can see, I'm not sure how big that image is on your screen, but if you if you have it large on your screen, you can see the the snap, the nose of the whale, is very very soft. It's not sharp at all. Whereas the underside, um, the whale's quite sharp. I have focused underwater, but the problem was is my f-stop wasn't narrow enough. I was using f9. I should have been using something like about f16. Now there's a good reason for that. Like I obviously knew that I had f9 dialed in. It was it was because it was just an awful awful day. It was big seas, howling winds, horizontal rain, very very low light, um, and that's the only option I had. That I was wasn't really counting on the whale sticking its head out of the water. I was hoping just to get some drama in the sky there and get the whale fully underwater but as he came over to me he stuck his nose out and I shot that image knowing as soon as I took the image I know it would work I knew it would be out of focus on the surface my only option there would have been to get up to f16 which I probably would have required would have mean pushing my ISO up to you know um, ISO 1000 plus which would have given me a really grainy image that I probably wouldn't have used anyway so um, I didn't want to bring my shutter speed down to compensate for that because as I say it was quite big seas getting bashed all over the place any slower shutter speed it would have been blurred so there's not really a lot I could do in that situation that's one of those awful low light days where you just have to do what you can but it's a great example of what happens when your f dot isn't wide enough shooting over under. Now this is a more successful image lots of light here I was able to shoot f22 the water was nice and calm so 160th of a second um, and you can see the top side of the image there is nice and sharp. So two perfect examples, um, F9 didn't work, F22 worked perfectly. Okay, moving on. Exposure. So I'm going to talk now about exposure with strobes and with natural light. So when I'm photographing a subject that's within reach of the strobe, so anything up to about two meters away, like a reef or a smallish animal or you know, a model, anything like that, I'll probably be using strobes to add some light um, to the underwater scene. Because normally underwater, we've got a, a light fall off of often four to five, so depending on where the sun position is, but maybe four to five stops darker underwater than it is on the surface. So it's good to use strobes if you can. Um, in the situations where you can't use strobes is for things like really big animals, such as whales. Um, because the animal's just too big and too far away, the strobe would have zero effect on it. So we need to um, get around that by shooting natural light. And that's quite a different technique when it comes to exposure and uh, slightly different equipment I would use. And, um, and I'll talk about that too. But for the, for the moment, we'll talk about using strobes. So when I'm um, gonna set up my exposure for a strobe split shot, um, I will take my exposure from the sky that's in the image. And what I will do is I will use my histogram quite a lot uh, when I'm setting up the exposure here. So what I want to do is I don't want to burn the sky out because um, if I lose the information, I can't bring it back in post and it looks awful with big bleached out spots in the sky. It's, it doesn't make for a nice picture. So what I will do is I'll actually expose the sky, but I expose it maybe a stop and a half to two stops to the right. So slightly overexposed. Um, because I know it's ex it is overexposed, but it's not overexposed to a point where I can't bring it back in post. Um, I don't want to go too far to the right because I will overexpose. And the reason I'm pushing it to the right is so I can bring in as much shadow detail underwater as possible. If I expose the sky perfectly straight in the middle of that histogram there on the nose, um, a lot of underwater information will go into dark shadow. And when I try and pull that out later, um, it's going to get noisy. And, and, 
fuzzy and, and not look great. So, so basically I'm, I'm moving the whole histogram over to the right as far as a day ago without blowing out any highlights to help the shadows of the water. Um, and then I will set my strobe output to give me just the amount, right amount of light on the subject. This is actually a very small subject. This turtle here was about three and a half centimeters long, about two minutes old, straight hatched out of sand on the beach and into the water. And I knew that this opportunity was only going to last um, a minute, like at sunset, the turtles are going to be out and they're going to be gone. So what I did is actually spent an entire day using different dome ports, different lenses, strobe techniques to get my technique down pat. So when the opportunity arose, I knew that I just had to point the camera and fire and I wasn't messing around, changing strobe outputs and setting exposures and things like that. That was all ready to go back. And it's good to be prepared in um, situations like this where the action's not going to last very long at all. And oh, there's the exposure, 15th of a second, F22, I said 200. Okay, and this is now a natural light exposure. Um, so like I said before, a large subject like a whale, you can't really use a strobe. The whale's three or four meters away from me, very large. Uh, there's no strobe on this planet that is gonna um, illuminate that um, whale. So that's why the advantage I was talking earlier on about the, the, the new Nikon L-series uh, series lens has got um, a filter thread on the front. So that's a 14 mil, so that's an ultra wide um rectilinear lens um sorry s series and l2 um ultra wide rectilinear lens um 14 mil it's got an 82 mil um, thread on the front and what that allows me to do is use one of these little fellows so that is a neutral density um graduated filter that's a four stop neutral density graduated filter so dark on the top clear on the bottom and that screws straight onto the front of that lens and then i can use that to bring the sky down. So this was already quite a dark day anyway, but had I not used a filter like that and exposed for the whale underwater, the sky would have just gone white. And there would be no information there for me to um, see or even bring back in post or anything. Um, if I'd have exposed for the sky on that day, the whale would have been so dark, it wouldn't have seen it on the frame. And in post, I may have been able to bring a whale shape back, but it would have been very grainy, noisy, and, and not a smooth, clean image like you see there. So. Using a filter like that in a situation like this is almost a perfect photograph straight out the box. Very little post-processing to do. The sky looks nice, the whale's well exposed, um, and that's a great way around that little problem. So there we go. Um, as I said, four stop neutral density ground on the top, um, exposed on the water scene. And that was 400 of the second, F9. Um, I said 400, it's actually the same whale that I uh, messed up earlier on, just a few, few frames apart. But this is more like the shot I was set up for and, and preparing for anyway. Now, preventing water droplets. This is the um, question I get asked quite a lot. Um, how do you prevent water droplets? And a lot of people seem to get confused. There's two different methods and, and of doing this. Um, and people sometimes kind of mix them all up and, and, and get it all in a bit of a muddle. So I'm the, clearly go through the two different processes to prevent water droplets and what we're actually doing when we when we do this so i've coined these phrases um, a hydrophobic method and an emulsifying method so the emulsifying method you're trying to make the water stick evenly all over the port and then the hydrophobic method you're trying to make the water rapidly drain off the port um, for the emulsifying method, we can use things like spit or sea drops, um, antifog, potato juice is works, but it's a bit um, not quite so convenient. Um, I tend to use the sea drops antifog um, because there's plenty of it. And if I'm using a big port, I can put that on there and smear it all over. And what that does, it does exactly the same as what it does in your dive mask. Now, the reason you put it in your dive mask is you're encouraging a layer of water to stick evenly all over the inside of your mask. Um, by doing that, obviously the fog is microscopic beads of water forming if the mask is already in, wet inside that fog can't form slightly different reason why we're doing it on the outside obviously we're encouraging the water to stick all over so the beads don't the, you know the water tension doesn't build up and split and create the beads that ruin the shot and then the other method is the hydrophobic method we can use wax polish or rain x or any sort of wax based product and what that does is it prevents the water from sticking full stop so that makes the water roll off sometimes you need to give the port a bit of a shake 
and the water will roll off. The hydrophobic method works better on glass, I've found. And um, if you buy a bottle of Rain-X, it does say do not use on plastics um, because it can burn and ruin the surface of the plastic. So if you're using a plastic port, I would highly, uh, acrylic port, I would highly recommend the sea drops anti-fog um, or spit method. If you're using a glass dome port, then Rain-X wax polish or or the anti-fog method works um, equally as well on glass. Now, I always, I always used to say, when pe people used to ask me, oh, which seed drops to use or which mask anti-fog, I used to say any of them will work, but I actually proved myself wrong on that. Um, a few weeks ago, I was over in Tonga and I'd forgotten to take my little bottle out of anti-fog and someone had like a spray version on the boat, I put that on and it wasn't working at all. I kept putting it on and rubbing it and the water was beating up. Um, so I think it was too, not viscous enough, it was too fine a product. Um, and then the upper end of the scale, if you use like the Sea Drops Gold, which is really, really thick, heavy gel, you rub that on, it tends to make the port quite streaky. So I just use the standard Sea Drops um, product and that seems to work the best. And um, when you're using the emulsify method, very important to keep your port clean, um, keep it free from grease, um, sunscreen. If, if you just rub sunscreen on your nose, don't be tempted to touch your port. Or if you're using one of these big ports and someone's there sitting on the boat rubbing sunscreen on the nose, temptation is to come over and tap it and ask you what it's made out of because it's a big novel product. Um, don't let them do it because as soon as you get a piece of bit of grease on there, it's going to split. Uh, that meniscus is going to keep splitting and, you, and you've ruined the whole method because you're counteracting what you're trying to do. Um, the hydrophobic method works well, doesn't hide scratches. Um, as you know, a, a plastic port, when you immerse it in the sea, the scratches miraculously vanish. Same thing when the water's stuck all over it, you don't see the scratches. Whereas if you're trying to use a hydrophobic method and you shoot into the sun, all those um, nasty scratches will start to show up. And the techniques obviously aren't interchangeable because they're opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, one's trying to make the water stick, one's trying to make the water flood off. So if you've greased, if you've covered your port in Rain-X um, and it's not working for you, you can't really go to put the anti-fog on because you're counteracting what you're trying to do, basically. So you've got to pick a method and try and stick with it. Um, so this is a short video just demonstrating um, the uh, emulsifier method using some, some um, anti-fog. So as you can see, I just dipped my port in the water there and it's all covered in nasty beads straight away. Um, shot, ruin, shot, photograph ruining um, highlights of beads and out of focus droplets, which is not nice. Just showing my hand there, I've got no sunscreen on, no rings or anything that's gonna scratch the port. That's the product I'm using, so some sea drops. Just squirt that on the port there. Don't need heaps, just enough to cover. Rub it right to the edges, important to get right to the edges so the whole port gets a nice even covering. Like that. And then dip it in the water. Quick rinse just to get the streaks off. Pull it out and you're good to go and you're happy to fire away nice and bead free. That will probably last about two or three minutes. Um, and then it might split and bead up again. So just a quick dip and you're, and you're good to go. But as a general rule of thumb, I tend to get in the habit just before I shoot, just at the height of the action, I'll dip and I'll shoot just to make sure. Um, so dip, shoot, dip, shoot, dip, shoot. And that, and that keeps those beads away. And so a quick recap of everything I've gone through, if you're still with me and I've not confused you all. <laughs> right. So, sorry, I am rushing through this quite, and will normally take me time a bit more over this, but um, I guess it's on video, so you can watch it as many times as you want. So here's my thought process in getting this shot here at Roger Ampat um, a couple of years ago. So make sure the port is clean, use man mask anti-fog to prevent the beading. So I've already done that on the boat before I've got in the water. Set my ambient exposure up for the sun there, so um, smallest aperture possible. Set my strobe output up. Um, strobes are set to fill in the scene underwater, so I know my output's correct. So when these fish come along, I'm ready to go. And not forgetting to focus on the underwater scene there. And done, an executed over under photograph. So that's all I've got about to say on that. Um, if there's any questions, then I think we're having a bit of a Q&A towards the end now. So hope that's helped you. Thanks for watching and um, See you again sometime. Things uh, like that. Hey. Take your screen off, uh, Maddie. Take okay. your screen off. Uh, click. Yeah, go back to your face. Yeah, I'll yeah. go back. Exactly. Is that it? Yeah. I mean, it's not what I would prefer, but yes. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, come
come on, you had turtles before. Oh, true that. <laughs> so, um, what? Just, this is the brain axe. Oh, yeah. Ah. Right? And it, is this the one we are talking about that is your, you are suggesting, this one? Uh, sea buff. No, I've not used that one. Um, I just normally the sea drops. Um, it's in that little video there because it's like an orange lid. Okay. But okay. Uh, if it's like a medium viscosity, uh, not too thin, not too thick, um, it should be okay. But I've not used that one, so I can't. Um, okay. Sure. okay. Okay, question time. So there's a question from Renee. Um, why did you choose a, sh a slow shutter speed of 1 15th for the baby turtle? Because the reason I did that is I wanted to get some of the ambient green in the background. If you could see all the sand on the bottom and the seagrass, I didn't want like a jet black background. Um, I just wanted the atmosphere in there. And also shooting a slow shutter speed like that with that small subject can actually sometimes, a little bit of movement in the fin tips and the turtle and everything can just add an extra um, dynamic to the picture and create a bit more of a 3D look and um, and yeah and it's just nice to see see the seabed basically if I'd have gone if I'd have shot at uh, you know a hundredth or a bit quicker that would have watched blacks and you probably would have seen a bit more backscatter as well like that, that those dark backgrounds tend to bring in all the impurities in the water and backscatter and things so slow shutter speeds can hide a lot of that type of stuff. Nice thanks okay one more question from James are you, aware, are you aware of anyone attempting the use of an automotive ceramic coating for the hydrophobic method? An, uh, oh, sorry, say that one again. Are you aware of anyone attempting the use of an automotive ceramic coating for the hydrophobic method? No, I'm not. But if, um, if sorry, what was his name, James? James, yeah. yeah. So if James has got access to that kind of technology and um, wants to let us know how it goes with it or even share it, then I would be more than happy to find out. But no, I've, I've never. All heard right. Yeah. I guess that must be some kind of coating for a windscreen or something, maybe. I don't know. Possibly, yeah. Yep. He, uh, James says, I don't have a spare dome to experiment on. <laughs> I said, okay. Um, <laughs> fair that point, that James. Fantastic. It wouldn't work on acrylic, I'm guessing. Probably not. I'm thinking yeah. not. That would probably be just glass. Yeah. yeah. Um, question from Scott. Uh, how do you balance the camera if you have a large dome port where the rig might be very buoyant? Well, um, I don't have them with me. Actually, in one of the frames earlier on, if you can go back and watch the video when I'm talking about dome ports, you can just see in there, it's the frame where I've got the big dome port and the, um, and the monitor. By the way, if anyone has got access to those monitors, they make shoot over unders a breeze. They are so, so good. You can just sit there and watch everything that's going on and just pull the trigger. Amazing. Anyway, um, so what I've got is I actually got two um, large clean canteens, so stainless steel drinks containers. They're about a litre and a half each, quite big, very round and buoyant. And I made some brackets. Um, so I'll take the lid off and then I've made a special bracket that screws in where the lid goes. It's got a ball, a three quarter inch ball joint that you use on your strobe arms normally. And then I attach that to the bottom, to the base of the housing using clamps into the tripod socket. And what that does is it creates a very stable platform. So I have these two large stainless steel flotation containers at the back, the dome port at the front, and everything just, I can let go of it. It just sits in the water 50-50. A lot of people, like, with a really big dome ports, um, I'll put a bracket on the actual dome port and put some lead on it. But the, mo but the most important thing I've learned through doing this is buoyancy at the back is far better than weight at the front. So if you can get the back of the, especially if you're using like an aluminium housing, if you can get the back of that out of the water, the weight of the camera and the housing then has some um, momentum to push down and push the port down. So making the back buoyant is better than making the front heavy, if that makes sense. And that tends to sit it better in the water. Makes sense, all actually, right. Well, actually another tip I've used before that works quite well. Um, you know, the, the like the uh, kick, kickboards that swimmers use in the swimming pool that might hold on to and kick up and down the swimming pool. I've got a, one of those, like a, a thick black one, I cut a big hole in and then I can clamp that to the bottom of the housing as well and that, that works quite well too. Nice. The yep. low budget option. The That's low good. Budget option. <laughs> I like it. Um, we have another question uh, from Rusty. Um, yep. Do you ever use split diopter and if so, what magnification? No, I don't use split diopter. I know some, I was having a conversation with David Dublé. I know he's done it before in the past. 
Um, but no, I've not done that. I, the thing is with it, and I remember this is what David said to me, is it's, it works quite well, but you have to get that split line perfectly on the water line. If you're a bit mm -hmm. off or down, it kind of it can uh, show up a little bit. So it, it probably, yeah, it, it works, but I've not done it. I think that is probably. a technique we used in the, in the early days when, when the uh, white angle lens of the fisheye hasn't got that great uh, depth of field. And yeah. that's what we use in the early days. We use a normal wide angle lens, like a 20, 20 mm, 18 mm, yeah. that's just with the aperture. But these days, with the fish eye, with the white 40 mm, you just don't need it anymore. Yeah, yeah, right. There. Cool. Any more questions? I'm, I'm checking on, on Facebook to make sure we don't miss anybody's questions. Um, no, so far, we've on Facebook answered. Today. We just it didn't go at all. Okay, yeah. cool. No, no. no. Well, no. fine then, just here. No, exactly. I think that's too many well then then currently we have answered everyone's questions <laughs> which is good does anybody have any other questions before we wrap it up so tomorrow who have we got on for tomorrow tomorrow you are oh, hold on let me change the background or maybe not i don't know if i've got the current one actually <laughs> i might not i might have the dates all messed up but um yeah so tomorrow um Tomorrow's gonna to be one hour earlier start time than normal because we've got uh, two talks happening tomorrow. Very exciting. So um, they're both centered around um, taking your images that you've shot and either uh, picking ones that are gonna be great for uh, competitions or kind of curating your own portfolio of images. So we're gonna start with that one, the second one, um, which is curating a portfolio and that's by Miriam. Um, so Miriam um, does a lot of our photo editing for OG um, and has done this also for quite a few National Geographic photographers. So um, she's going to be talking about curating your own portfolio. Uh, and then Michael, uh, then we have one hour break. Uh, so let's see, Miriam is talking at, at um, 8 p.m. New York time. So 8 p.m. Eastern, um, which is on the 12th uh, in the U.S., which is... 8 a.m. the 13th in Singapore. Uh, I think I got that right. Uh, then we take a one hour break. 9 a.m. Sydney time? Okay. 9 a.m. Sydney time, yes. Okay, fine. Be difficult. No. <laughs> um, and then we're taking an hour break. So Miriam technically will be on between 30 and 40 minutes. Um, and then we'll take an, uh, a break and then come back um, an hour later for Michael's talk. Um, which is going to be about selecting images that are going to win those competitions. So we've got two. Uh, right. And like I, I said, both of those. <laughs> what are we doing? Right. I'm going to take them both. I'm going to watch them both, and I'm going to put my um, OG <laughs> into yeah. the OG. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well that's sort of why we're doing it that way. <laughs> I'm going to go pick you guys behind a scene of it of the judging room. Uh, for Ocean Geographic Pictures of the Year competition, as well as the judging room where I've just been to uh, very recently in, in, in London for the National History Museum. And basically take you through the judging process and how you pick the images, what to do, what not to do, and how the deliberation goes on in the judging rooms with you some inside, insider secrets that you should know to give you a better chance to, to, to win those competitions. So all will be reviewed tomorrow. Perfect. <laughs> yep. Cool. So, uh, and then. So, we've got a couple more questions. I, I, yep, okay, yeah. what? <laughs> questions first? Okay. Questions, okay. questions first. We have two more questions. All right. Um, so, Scott wants to know with the small dome port, do you have yep. issues with light coming in the side of the port when using strobes? No. Um, what I actually do when I'm using a small dome port, um, I don't have a housing cell to show you, but I use an inward lighting technique. So if I'm using a like a four inch port, obviously you can get the strobes in shot quite easily as, as you know when you shoot an ultra wide or, or sorry, fish eyes you would be with that, behind that port. But what I will actually do is rather than having the, the dome, well, rather than having the strobes kind of pointing out like, like you might do shoot a wide angle underwater, I turn them in on themselves and literally point them at the handles of the water housing. So, and I take the diffusers off too. Yeah. So what that does is by it creates it creates like a nice um, it's kind of hard to explain right so here's here's my lens inside the dome port by turning the strobe on either side 
inwards and shooting like this, I get, and without the diffuser, I get a hard edge of light that just crosses the front of the port. A lot of the light from the strobe is wasted. It's just flashing off, bouncing off the side of the housing. But what I do get is a nice hard edge of light that just cuts across the front of the four inch port from either side. So you're not over um, exposing the back scatter and any mess you might have in the background, but you're just creating a nice little edge of light right here where your subject's gonna be. Because basically when you're shooting them through a four inch port, something small like that, the subject's gonna be here. It's gonna be right in front. So just using that edge of that light cuts out back scatter in the background and it, and it prevents a lot of uh, what Scott's asking. Yeah, I've become obsessed with doing that because of you. I saw you do that one time and was like, why would anyone do such a thing? And then you explained it and I was like, oh, I'm never shooting any other way. So that's become the, the only close focus wide angle technique. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Um, and then one more um, from Jason. How about an oversized dome for Axis Go? Would it work? Um, I think those are the um, the ones that fit on the smartphones or on like smaller. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Made by um, Aquatech or something like that. I, yeah, yeah, yeah Aquatech. Yeah. 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 So I think they it would. Yeah, it would because you can buy them for other housings that make mobile phones. There's a, there's a company that makes them for action cameras, um, small dome ports that fit. It doesn't have to be a huge dome port for a, for a smaller camera like that because the sensor is a lot smaller. So you're getting more depth of field and it's kind of a miniaturized version of what you're trying to achieve on a big um, SLR camera. So uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm not really um, familiar with the um, Axis Go products, but I do believe they make a, a port that's about this size that would that fits on the housing and and has a, a, a miniaturized same effect if that makes sense cool all right it. i think that did it we've <laughs> got today. everybody so uh, later on we'll post this and this entire presentation in entirety on facebook and also on ocean to graphic page on youtube and we'll send you the link to have a look later otherwise thank you maddie thank you no problem. Thank Thanks, you. Maddie. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Okay. See you tomorrow. Same time, same place. Yeah. <laughs> Different time. No, one hour earlier. <laughs> okay. <laughs> same time. <laughs> and see you tonight, guys. Maddie, see you tonight and see you in the morning for our little party. Yeah. Sure thing. All I'll right. get one. You better tell me about this. <laughs> I'll tell you about that. It's a secret party. <laughs> oh. <laughs> have a good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks.